the lecture on overdiagnosed, making people sick in the pursuit of health um, by Gilbert H. Gilbert Welch, who is a professor of medicine at Dartmouth Institute of for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. I'll say very, very few things about the lecture and then introduce the speaker. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the title is self-explanatory, what the subject is going to be this evening. Uh, essentially deals with the fact that over the, the past several decades, there has been a, a growing enthusiasm for early diagnosis, engaging many physicians in a systematic search for abnormalities in people who are well. So the question is, is that good or bad? And that's what the speaker is going to address this evening. And with that, let me introduce the speaker. H. Gilbert Welch is professor of medicine at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Research in the Geisel School of Medicine. He's professor of public policy at Dartmouth College, a professor of business administration at Dartmouth's Amos Stack School, a practicing general internist at the White River Junction Veterans Administration Medical Facility. He has been practicing uh, medicine and doing medical research for over 25 years, and for a time served as visiting scientist at the International Agency for Research on Cancer. His research has been um, on early detection of diseases, particularly melanoma, uh, thyroid, lung, breast, and prostate cancer. The research has led him to counterintuitive conclusions. That the physicians test too often, treat too aggressively, and tell too many people that they are sick without significant health benefits, often with detrimental effects. His scholarly work has been published widely in leading medical journals, including the Annals of Internal Medicine, the Journal of the American Medical Association, the New England Journal of Medicine, and the Journal for, of the National Cancer Institute. Uh, Professor Welch has published in, frequently in the national media, including the New York Times and the Los Angeles Times. His first book, Should I Be Tested on, for Cancer? Maybe Not, and Here's Why, published in, in, 20, in 2004, was listed by Malcolm Gladwell as one of the six best books of the year in the Week magazine. His second book, Overdiagnosed, Making People Sick, in the Pursuit of Health was published in 2011. And with that, please join me in welcoming Professor Welch to deliver his speech this evening. I, I'm on. Thank you very much. Good evening. How are you? Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I'm from Colorado. Uh, and so as you can imagine, <laughs> Uh, it's a great honor uh, to be here in the Powell Auditorium, um, even though most of the rivers he was on were in Utah and Arizona. But, um, <clears throat> but anyway, Powell's a quite, quite an uh, you know, amazing character, and I'm uh, very pleased to, to be in this room. And here's an image that's obviously on a stamp of him going down the Colorado and there are a lot of images like this at the time. This is the sort of thing that appeared in the Eastern papers, uh, wonderful sort of artistic uh, views of the Grand Canyon. I, I, I got this from a website uh, where it is actually titled Historical Badass, John Wesley Powell. This is a photograph from the uh, expedition. Of course, the photographs didn't have uh, such moving water. It wasn't easy to take a quick picture, you know, you had to set things up. But sort of wonderful uh, visions of the uh, American West during that uh, exploration, the wonderful Western uh, landscapes. So given where we are in the Powell Auditorium, it seems reasonable to start with the question, does the evolution of our understanding of Western landscapes offer anything to our understanding of medicine. And you might say, well, boy, Gil, that's a stretch. But um, I'd like to show you one other Western landscape that maybe you're not uh, so familiar with. This is Eastern Washington State. Any of you driven through Eastern Washington State? Yeah, okay. So you know a little, if you've been through it, you know it's a pretty different landscape. It's an extremely uh, barren uh, landscape. It's dry, uh, rocky, uh, treeless landscape. Um, but it's not flat. Instead, it's laced with these uh, large braided channels that have been cut through really hard rock, basaltic uh, rock, solid rock. 
And there, there are these little sort of potholes where you can imagine, you know, water whooshing around, immense in size. There are broad canyons, you know, just look like, boy, there must have been a lot of water there at one point. Uh, there are narrow, steep canyons. Again, you don't see any water, and in fact, this old railroad bed, there's not even a culvert under this thing. You say, wow, what, what is that? And there are remnants of huge waterfalls. Imagine water coming down over this lip. Here's the other side coming down this lip. And what makes this area so unique is what you don't find. You don't find the water that needed, was needed to create those features. Well, J. Harlan Bretz was the uh, first geologist to study uh, these landscapes. And he called the region the channeled scablands. And he believed he knew what caused them. Sudden, massive flooding. Flooding on a scale simply not seen today. Flooding on a scale like emptying Lake Michigan on the state of Illinois in a matter of days. And in 1923, he published a paper outlining his argument. But invoking such a cataclysmic event was you know, antithetical to the prevailing dogma of geology at the time. And that prevailing dogma was something like this. The world around us is a product of slow processes, weak forces, and plenty of time. Plenty of time as in hundreds of thousands of years. A catastrophic event like a massive flood was bound not to sit well. And it didn't. In 1927, he uh, told his story, his beliefs, to the Geological Society of America here in Washington, uh, D.C. And the quote I'm going to give you now is written by an emeritus professor at the University of Montana who describes the reactions to Brett's hypothesis. A couple of his most prominent detractors converted the occasion into what they called the debate, but was more like an ambush. Some who were there described it as a lynching. Several of the prominent geologists in the audience denounced Bretz's ideas in terms so abrasive they were personal insults. It was by all accounts a shameful display, especially considering some of the most vocal detractors still had not visited the Scablands, had never seen them had no personal knowledge of the extraordinary landscapes. They based their arguments entirely on the received gospel of slow processes, weak forces, and plenty of time. Well, as I'm sure you may have surmised already, I, the reason I tell you uh, this story is because Bretz's ideas were eventually shown to be correct. Joseph Pardee, a geologist working for the U.S. Geologic Survey, discovered the source of the flood, a huge glacial lake, Missoula. And it was formed by an ice dam. As the ice advanced from the continental ice sheet, blocking the drainage of the Columbia River, a huge lake formed behind the ice. And when it rose high enough, at literally 2,000 feet of depth, the ice dam lifted off, literally floated off, and the water shot down across eastern Washington State, even extended up the Willamette Valley near Portland and Salem and so forth. Yeah, but it took decades for this idea to be accepted. Satellite imaging such as this helped make the floods more obvious. You can kind of see how the water must have come across. And once the idea was accepted, geologists found evidence of massive flooding from ice dams elsewhere in the world. Now, of course, Brett's being right doesn't mean the geologic dogma is always wrong. Most geologic structures are the result of slow processes, weak forces, and plenty of time. So it's not always wrong, but it's not always right the truth is somewhat more nuanced. Now, the prevailing dogma in my field is that the best strategy to keep people healthy is early diagnosis. 
And I'm not saying that's all was wrong. But I'm going to ask you tonight to consider the possibility that it's not always right. That in fact the truth is a little bit more nuanced. Let me start by telling you a little bit about myself. 57 years ago I was born a privileged white child. Here is a picture of me. <laughs> and it's actually just across the river. My father was working here in Washington at the time. And I know you folks don't have a lot of clinical experience, some of you may, but if you look at this child, you immediately recognize there's some things wrong. That's an overweight kid. Probably has toddler hypertension, <laughs> hyperlipidemia for sure, glucose intolerance. And then I want you really to look at that face. We have a technical term for it in medicine. It's a funny-looking kid. <laughs> Undoubtedly, I have a bunch of single nucleotide polymorphisms, a couple of genetic variants, maybe even a frame shift mutation. But the real question is, what is going on in there? <laughs> Look at that thing. Could that be an early saculation of the abdominal aorta, maybe about to burst? And now I realize I'm glad I was born 57 years ago. Let me take you fast forward in time. This is O'Hare Airport. This is an advertisement for IBM. And in this world of money, I feel impelled to say, you know, uh, I am a shareholder of IBM, although the pictures you're seeing are coming from a Macintosh. Um, but I want you to look at the message here that we've been sort of trained to think is a good thing. Medical histories that alert doctors before patients get sick. And we've been taught to think, boy, that's a good, that would be a good thing if we were alerted about patients before they got sick. But then I want you to think about that a little bit. First, that might be a lot of alerts. And as I go through the process tonight, keep this in mind. Is that really a good thing? The title of my talk is Overdiagnosed, Making People Sick in the Pursuit of Health. In it, I'm going to question this widespread presumption that the best strategy to keep people healthy is through early diagnosis. A disclaimer before I start. The views expressed here do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Veterans Affairs or the United States government. This could be said of many of my views. Um, and because my interest is to provide you for a feel of the breadth of the problem, this will necessarily be a cursory review. So think of it as being a, a mile wide and an inch deep, because I want to give you some sense of how this happens throughout uh, medicine. I have a book on the topic, as uh, the introduction mentioned, with my colleagues, Lisa Schwartz and Steve Voloshin. Um, and I had an earlier book uh, about a decade ago, Should I Be uh, Tested for Cancer? Um, I want to be clear, I have no financial interest in these books. I quickly decided when I started this topic, I didn't want to be making uh, money off it. And so all the uh, royalties for these books go to local charities in the Upper Valley of Connecticut, uh, of the Connecticut River, which is where, where I live. And before you think I'm just an incredibly generous uh, human being, I want to be clear we're not talking a lot of money. Um, uh, but, <laughs> but I do have a strong professional interest. So if you come away uh, wondering a little bit more about why I'm saying what I'm saying, I encourage you to buy a book, buy it used, get it from eBay, take it from a friend. I don't care where you get it, but uh, I, I, I hope you'll take the time to read it. Here's an overview for where I hope to go. First, I want to define the term overdiagnosis, and then I want to talk about four mechanisms. Uh, and the first is we change the rules, and we will refer to physicians, the medical culture. The second is we are able to see more. Third is we look harder. And the fourth is we stumble onto things. And then I'll uh, have a couple of concluding remarks on moving forward. Let's start with what is overdiagnosed. It is the detection of an asymptomatic abnormality or condition that either will never progress 
or will in fact regress, or B, will progress slowly enough that the patient dies of other causes before symptoms appear. So in other words, overdiagnosis occurs when an abnormality is diagnosed in someone for whom it will never be relevant. It's not something they're ever destined to experience. Now, I want you to understand this is a side effect. Overdiagnosis is a side effect of what we've been taught and believe is the right way to practice medicine, to detect and treat disorders before they cause problems. The only way you can make an overdiagnosis is to be looking for things to be wrong before it causes symptoms. Now, I want to be clear, there's a conundrum. This is not easy. Clinicians can never know who's overdiagnosed at the time of Diagnosis. It's not like a patient's label, I'll be overdiagnosed, I'm not. We may have some clues which group people are in. But clinicians don't know which one is overdiagnosed. They're not doing this purposely. Overdiagnosis is only confirmed in the individual if that individual is A, never treated, and B, goes on to die from some other cause. That doesn't happen that often. Thus, we tend to treat everybody. Diagnoses tend to engender treatment, thereby producing the major harm of overdiagnosis. Treatment that can't help. You cannot help someone who was never destined to have a problem. There's nothing to fix. Treatment that can only lead to harm. And the truth is, all of our treatments have some harms. Some clearly more than others. It's not like they're all the same, but all of our treatments have some harm. How did we get here? What started this? What's the genesis of this problem? Well, it's really in the detection and treatment of hypertension, high blood pressure. And I know I can imagine some people say, wow, I thought hypertension was one of the most important things doctors do. Yes, it is one of the most important things we do. But it's also where the problem of overdiagnosis begins. Let me start by telling you why I think it's one of the most important things we do, and I'll share with you a classic randomized trial done by the Department of Veterans Affairs in 1967. They recruited patients, and this was males, because that's predominantly what the VA treated at the time, with diastolic blood pressure elevation in the hospital. They had to pass a test of outpatient compliance that I'll come back to in a minute, and their average outpatient diastolic blood pressure was 115 to 129. Let me be clear, we're talking about the bottom number. You'd be forgiven if you thought we were talking about the top number, but we're talking about the bottom number. That's really, really high blood pressure. So the groups are randomized, allocated by chance, into one of two groups, a two-drug group getting hydrochlorothiazide and reserpine, the other group getting a placebo. They're followed forward in time, only a year and a half, not very long follow-up by today's standards. Let's see what happens. This again is a setting in men who have diastolic blood pressures over 115. We've got 73 patients getting placebo, 70 patients getting active treatment. It's not a very big trial by today's standards. In the placebo group, there were four deaths. In the treatment group, there were none. In the placebo group, there were four strokes. In the treatment group, there was one. In the placebo group, there were four cases of congestive heart failure. In the treatment group, there were none. There were two heart attacks in the placebo group. In the treatment group, there were none. There were three cases of kidney failure in the placebo group. In the treatment group, there were none. There were seven hemorrhages of the eye, retinal hemorrhages in the placebo group. In the treatment group, there were none. There were three hospitalizations for high blood pressure in the placebo group. In the treatment group, there were none. Treatment complications, thank God, there were no treatment complications in the placebo group. <laughs> and there was only one in the treatment group. I'll do the math for you, it's late as night. That's 27 events among 73 people over 1.5 years versus two. Now we don't see studies like this much anymore. And one of the things I like about a study like this is guess what, you don't need a statistician. <laughs> you don't need any fancy statistics. You, know, you flip a coin 29 times, how often does it come up? 27 times the heads? Not very often. 
It's one of the most important things we do. And sometimes it's important to go back to things that are really important so we're grounded about what a big effect is. This is a huge effect. It is one of the most important things we do. By the way, I said I wanted to come back to this outpatient compliance. The VA investigators were really, really careful. They did not want to randomize people that weren't going to take medicines. So, before the patient could be enrolled in the trial, they had to pass a test of outpatient compliance. That test involved being given two placebos, one of which makes the urine fluoresce, and they were seen twice in follow-up for pill count and to test their urine to make sure they would take their medicine. Nearly half the patients failed that test. For context, today in randomized trial, compliance rates are around 95% with medications. What was so different? In the 1960s, people didn't take medicines when they felt well. They only took medicines when they felt ill. There wasn't a, this openness to taking a pill when you felt well. That's why I say hypertension marks the beginning of intervention on asymptomatic patients. But it was the good thing to do. It was the right thing to do. What goes wrong? We change the rules. What constitutes high blood pressure? By changing the rules, I mean lower diagnostic and treatment thresholds, lower triggers to, to act, to make the diagnosis. When I was in medical school, high blood pressure was defined as a diastolic blood pressure greater than 100. We didn't even know the top number existed. That's not true. We knew it existed. We didn't think it was important. We didn't think systolic hypertension was anything more than hard pipes. We were only interested in the bottom number. Now, we define high blood pressure as anything above 140 over 90. And doctors such as me are getting feedback about individual patients' blood pressures. And I'm very happy to know about people who have really high blood pressure that might have been elevated for the VA trial. But I'm also getting things on moderate patients. I get this sheet every month. And I know you can't quite see the numbers. Here's one. Here's a patient, a, 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 an 82-year-old uh, male, 142 over 64. Here's another one. This is a 78-year-old uh, male, 144 over 68. By the way, I'll tell you a little bit about this patient. He lives alone. The nearest person to him is about 20 miles away. He loves to work outside. He works on stone walls. He works on his house. He gets on ladders. He clears brush. He uses a chainsaw. And he has fallen. I'm supposed to treat that? I'm supposed to lower that further? Are you kidding me? As I said, the views here do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Defense. I think the VA is doing some great things in the electronic medical record, and this is not a beat up on all the electronic, but it is caution about our measurement, that we've got to make sure we don't push physicians into doing stupid stuff. Why do I say that? Because we know something about the effect of treatment across the spectrum of diastolic hypertension. I'll put a spectrum up here, a spectrum of the abnormality from severe high blood pressure, and that's the VA clinical trial I showed you, down to moderate, mild, and very mild. And I'm going to show you the result now of four randomized trials. And on the y-axis, I'm going to show the annual rate of death or end organ damage. That's the same outcome measure I detailed for you a few slides ago in the VA study. Things we care about, heart attacks, strokes, death, important things. And now I'm going to show you the event rate in the control group. That's the group getting the sugar pill. And what you see is what you'd expect. Who's going to have a lot of bad things happen to them? Someone with really high blood pressure. More bad things there than someone with moderate blood pressure. More than mild, more than very mild. It's just what you'd expect. Now I'll put the intervention group up in yellow. And you might say, why aren't they all down low? Well, because they're real data and real data look like this. This is the results of the trial. But my point is, the benefit of treatment is the difference between the two bars. That's the treatment benefit. That's the reason to intervene. And if I take all those double bars away and say, let's just look at the treatment benefit, 
you see this pattern. And maybe this is a long run for a short slide, but it comes to the very basic principle, the people who stand the most to benefit from treatment are those with the severest, most abnormal conditions. Now I'll just draw a simple picture of this, where I say this spectrum from borderline hypertension to severe hypertension, this is what treatment benefit looks like. As I said at the outset, all of our treatments have harms. And so I've got to put a harm curve up there. And we could debate where that harm curve goes, but I'll start right here. And someone might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, why is it going up? Maybe it should be going down because who's most likely to be made hypotensive and fall? Someone whose blood pressure isn't that high to start with. And I'd say, well, maybe that's a good point. But for the purposes of my argument, all you need to understand or agree with is whatever the harm curve is, it's not as tightly related to the spectrum of abnormality. It's not so much a function of how sick the patient is, it's more an attribute of the treatment. If what I say is true, at least conceptually, sure, there's an area for net benefit, but there's also a point where there's going to be some net harm, at least theoretically. So, when it comes to high blood pressure, we've gotten really excited about it in diabetic patients. In diabetic patients, JNC7 says systolic blood pressure should be lowered to 130. And the American Diabetes Association said there's no threshold value for BP. No threshold value for blood pressure. Are you kidding me? No threshold value? So, let's say in the old days we were treating people with systolic blood pressures around 140. That involves so many patients. If we lower the threshold, we'll move things that way and we'll now include a whole bunch more patients because now we're going to treat people who are in here, 130s and the 125s. And what is the characteristic of whether they're likely? Well, they're the least likely to benefit and arguably they're on the edge of being the most likely to experience harm. Well, is that theoretical? Well, then this study came out. This is the INVEST study, International Verapamil SR Trendolopril study. Does everybody see where the INVEST comes from? Oh, come on, you don't see it that fast. It's hard, you have to study it. Let's see, it's I-N-V, there it is, S-T. I mean, what a crazy world. We work on these acronyms. I, I showed this at the Mass General and, and a cardiologist said, Gil, I can go one better. I, I got I-N-S-A-N-I-T-Y, the insanity study. But, <laughs> so we can work on that. But this is a perfectly legitimate uh, study. I'm beating up on the acronyms we work on. This is about patients with diabetes and coronary artery disease. And the question is, how aggressive should we be lowering their blood pressure? And, and I'm showing you now the all-cause mortality rates, deaths from any reason. I'm comparing it against a group whose blood pressure has been lowered to 125 to 130. If you get to 120 to 125, you don't see any effect. You get down to 115 to 120, you don't see any effect. It's all within the measurement error. 110 to 115, all of a sudden you see about a 70% increase in mortality. That doesn't seem good. And less than 110, all of a sudden there's no question. You see a twofold increase in mortality. We shouldn't be surprised about that. It's not good to have a blood pressure that's too low. There is a threshold. We shouldn't be pushing it too low. Now, I was just at Yale this morning, and I just learned, I learned something at Yale. I don't, I don't tell people at Dartmouth that, but um, that in fact, while I was in Australia a couple months ago, that in fact, things are changing. There are new diabetic guidelines to ease the systolic blood pressure targets because people have begun to wonder, should, are we pushing things too hard? So this is a good message. The new recommendation now raises the target from below 130 back up to 140. That's a good move. I'm really pleased to hear about that. Here's the guy 
um, who is in charge of the ADA Professional Practice Committee, he says on the basis of evidence that there's not a great deal of additional value, but there is an increased risk of pushing systolic blood pressure must below 140. I feel really good about that. People are beginning to think a little differently. Now, of course, in the effort to provide balance, there's another doctor who is quoted in there. And this is, I believe, the headline signs sends the wrong message. There are no new studies, only meta-analyses, which are for generating hypotheses that need to be tested. So this is the doctor said, oh, and he works for the uh, Metabolic Institute of America. He wants to keep prescribing more medicines. Now, what really interested me about this article was what is at the bottom. Dr. Grant has disclosed no relevant financial relationships. Dr. Handelsman has disclosed receiving grants from Beringer, Ingelheim, Tom Jim Chow, Sanger, Glaxo, Smith, Klein, Lexicon, Merck, Novos, Marcus, Tardis, I don't even know all those companies. And that's not the end of it. He serves as a consultant for Ameren, Amelin, and it's still not the end of it. And he's on the Speakers Bureau for blank, 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 blank. Wow. It's not just high blood pressure. This is, not, this is not a lone example. Diabetes. When I was in medical school, the definition of diabetes was a blood sugar greater than 140. Then overnight, about 15 years ago, it went to a fasting blood sugar of 126. And our efforts to try to make diabetics into normal, having normal blood sugars, have increased. We used to shoot for a hemoglobin A1C goal. That's the amount of sugar on the hemoglobin molecule that helps us get a sense of the average blood sugar in a diabetic patient. We used to shoot for seven to eight. And then someone suggested, no, we should try to get them normal. The normal range is under six. We should aggressively treat diabetes. Again, that means a whole bunch of new patients. That means if, if a, a diabetic is, 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 if someone has a hemoglobin A1C of 6.5, we're supposed to be treating that. And those new patients are those who stand the least to benefit and they stand to be at the highest risk for harm. Is that right? Am I, am, I, am I making that up? Is good control, maybe good control is really good for patients. This is a study of 50,000 patients with established type 2 diabetes, appeared in The Lancet two years ago. They had had long time diabetes, average of at least five years. They were undergoing intensification of therapy. That means more medicine or the addition of insulin to try to improve their blood sugar. And their blood sugar needed improvement. Their mean hemoglobin A1C was 9.5. The exposure we're interested in is how good did the doctors do? What is their hemoglobin A1C after we add more therapy? The outcome is going to be the rate of death from any cause. This is the only really complicated graph I'm going to show you, so I'll get you oriented. This is what we're trying to shoot for. We're saying, how well were the doctors able to control the blood sugar? That's the mean hemoglobin A1C after adding more therapy. The outcome is the relative rate of death from all causes. One is the magic number where there's no difference. Anything above one is increased risk. Anything below one is decreased risk. We're going to compare against this referent group of 7.5. That's where it was when I was in medical school. We were trying to get blood sugars around a hemoglobin A1C between 7 and 8. Now, if you can't quite get down to 7.5, you see a little bit of increased risk of death, although none of it's statistically significant, despite there being 200 deaths in each group. If you can't get them below 9, you see exactly what you expect to see, increased rate of death because glucose is a toxic molecule at high levels. But how about if you get them towards normal? You get them towards the left of the curve. Will that lower their mortality? No, it raises it. It raises it, and it's statistically significant. And it was confirmed in a randomized trial by the NIH that was stopped because of an increased death rate in the aggressive control. It's not that complicated. It's not good to have a glucose that's too low. It's not just hypertension and diabetes. There's high cholesterol. When I was in medical school, high cholesterol was a cholesterol greater than 300. Now, apparently having a detectable cholesterol is a bit of a problem. 
That's a little bit of an overstatement. I'll give you a but, 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 but you all know, and, and I'm going to say anything greater than 200 is abnormal. I know we fractionate, we use HDLs and LDLs. No one here, I think, will dispute the fact our threshold to, to treat cholesterol has fallen precipitously over the last 20 years. Osteoporosis, thinning of the bones, used to be defined as a T-score less than minus 2.5. And I apologize, you know, late in the evening now we're going to negative numbers and decimals. Ugh. I didn't make the rules. But about 10 years ago, that rules changed and osteoporosis uh, was to became uh, defined as less than minus 2.0. And you might say, geez, that doesn't make any difference. That's too small. And, and it's reasonable to say, well, well, how much do these changes really matter? How many people do they affect? Well, my colleagues and I studied that. We asked the question using the NHANES data and the natural distribution of these variables in the American population. How many people are affected by that rule change? In high blood pressure, it's 13 million Americans. In diabetes, it's about 2 million Americans. High cholesterol, it's 42 million because you're in the heart of the distribution now. And that silly little 0.5 turns 7 million American women into having the disease overnight. That's changing the rules. And then we're able to see more. This is the chest x-ray. This is how we used to diagnose lung cancer. That is a very abnormal chest x-ray. You're looking at it straight on. The heart's in the middle. But that's a big mass. That's a large lung cancer. This is a spiral CT scan. You're looking at one section of lung. It's been highly magnified. And you're now looking at a very small lung cancer. It's about one centimeter in size. What we know is there are a whole lot more of these than there are of those. This is a barium enema. This is how we used to make the diagnosis of colon cancer. One of the first things you learn in medical school is the abnormality is where the arrow is. <laughs> I'll fill it in for you. We call it a filling defect. And that, that is the abnormality. And that is a polyp. That is a large colonic polyp. It's about 10 centimeters in size. We don't do barium enemas much anymore. We do colonoscopies. And this is a colonoscopy, and that's a polyp. It's about one centimeter in size. This is the virtual colonoscopy of the same patient. That's the same polyp, about one centimeter in size. And my gastroenterology colleagues are removing polyps far smaller than that now. 0.4 centimeters, 0.3 centimeters in size. And what's the one thing we know is there are a whole lot more of those than there are of those. This is an x-ray of the breast. It's a technology that's been around since 1960s. We call it a plain film mammogram. And we'd say this is a very old technology now, but it sure can see a good-sized breast cancer. That's a two-centimeter lesion. This is the modern technology. It's a digital mammogram. It can be enhanced. The contrast can be changed. It can be rotated in space, and it can be enlarged. Everybody see the abnormality there? Well, you'd be forgiven if you can't, because it's literally pixels in size. It's about 0.02 centimeters. That's the microcalcifications that are now responsible for about a third of breast biopsies. They are the microcalcification associated with the early form, earliest form of breast cancer, the form that some pathologists wish the word carcinoma was never attached to, ductal carcinoma in situ. And the one thing we know is there are a whole lot more of these than there are of those. So what does it mean for us to be able to see more? Here, now, we're not changing the rules. It's not the doctors are changing. The technologies are, are sort of changing the rules. And we're beginning to see things we've never seen before. What does that mean? Well, let me ask you this question. How many states, lakes, are in the state of Utah? And since we're on the East Coast, I'll just remind you that's Utah. <laughs> How many lakes you see? Yeah, what is it? Great salt. Anybody been in it? Yeah, a little salty, huh? Yeah, it's good. Yeah, there's one. At, at this level of magnification, that's what you see. One lake in Utah. 
Now let's move into the state level view. And all of a sudden, whoa, there's more than one lake. Sure, there's the Great Salt Lake, just the northwest of Salt Lake City. And then right outside of Provo is Utah Lake. And then my favorite lake in the state is up north on the Idaho border called Bear Lake. So there are three lakes. And if you see some other bodies of water like this, they don't count their reservoirs. But there's this mountain range, the high Uinta, the, the, the biggest east-west mountain range in the United States. Let's just zoom in in one section, and we're now looking at satellite uh, data, and this is about an eight by four mile uh, section. And guess what? There are just a whole lot of lakes, aren't there? Are all the places littered with lakes? So, now we've got a problem. How many lakes are there in the state of Utah? Well, in the continental view, there is one. At the state level view, there are three. And just in one section of the mountain range, in the high Uinta, you have 39 plus. So, how many lakes are in the state of Utah? Well, there's not one single right answer. The answer depends on the resolution of the map. As you're able to see more, you find more. But the typical lake gets a lot smaller and arguably a lot less important. Now, what does this have to do with medicine? Well, I see this, the continental view, as being the history and physical exam where you're asking patients what's bothering them, you're seeing out what's overtly wrong with them. This is more like the chest x-ray, and of course this is the spiral CT. How many people have had a stroke? Fascinating research. This is part of the Framingham Heart Study, where patients who were asymptomatic, all were given an MRI to try to find out what the reservoir of the abnormality was. In the 70 to 89-year group, 15% who were walking around fine, no knowledge of anything wrong, had evidence of a stroke on MRI. 60 to 69, 10% of asymptomatic patients could said, be said to have a stroke. In my age group, 8% could, were said to have strokes by MRIs. And if you're younger than me, don't feel any better, because 7%, which is really an outstanding figure. It's unbelievable. And then you begin to say, well, wait a second, what does the word stroke mean? Have we just changed the definition of a lake to include a puddle? And that's exactly what's happening as we can see these smaller and smaller things. We have to really rethink what do we mean by the word stroke. And then we look harder. So we're changing the rules, we're able to see more, and then we look hard. That's more purposeful. This is Medicare data. We do a lot of Medicare data at Dartmouth. We're just looking simply at the number of Medicare exams over time. Brain CT doubled between 1990 and 2006. Abdominal CTs went up threefold. CAT scans of the chest up fivefold in that period. And brain sp spine MRIs up fivefold. A lot more cross sectional imaging going on in medicine. And then we encourage the well to get examined to determine if they are not, in fact, sick. We encourage the well to get examined to determine if they are not, in fact, sick. That's screening. Engaging the well into the system to see if we can find something wrong. Now, this is the sort of ad that can get my blood pressure up. At one level, it's a very visually appealing ad. A nice charcoal drawing of a nice young a uh, woman, it could be my daughter. Um, and, 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 and I love the calligraphy and I like the sort of coloring of the pastels and so forth. And let me just read it to you. It won't happen to me. I go to the gym every morning. I walk to the office and I don't let work stress me out. So here's a young woman doing all the right things, just what we'd want her to do. And then here in the smaller font, Alicia Fox, 21, the day before she was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Now, what is that ad designed to do? Scare you, right? It's scary. And in case, in case you miss, maybe it's all too subtle, uh, you know, it's too subtle. They then go on to say, confidence kills. 
Now that is a great public health message to get out. We should, if you feel good about yourself, something is really wrong with you. The last thing we want our population to do is to feel good about themselves. It goes on to say, thyroid cancer doesn't care how healthy you are. It can happen to anyone, including you. That's why it's the fastest growing cancer in the United States. Now, in fact, that doesn't even make sense. I don't know if you had any logic, right? It can happen to you, include that's why it's a fast. It doesn't even make sense. And it goes on to say, ask your doctor to check your neck. And then I looked at it and I said, oh, I see what happened. It's an editing problem. You know, I think if we do it this way, it's better. Thyroid cancer doesn't care how healthy you are. It can happen to anyone, including you. Ask your doctor to check your neck. That's why it's the fastest cancer. cancer. What's happening with thyroid cancer? Well, I'm going to show you. All the next series of slides I'm going to show you are from the federal government's SEER program, the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results. It's our major effort to track cancer in the United States. We're going to look at the period 1975 to 2005. And what's happening in thyroid cancer? Well, it's nice and stable until about the mid-90s, and then it takes off, and it doubles. Now, if that were an epidemic of disease, a genuine epidemic of more thyroid cancer, what would I expect to see? Well, I would expect to see some similar change in the death rate. It's, you know, the more real bad thyroid cancer, I'd expect to see the death rate go up. Or maybe I'd see the death rate start to go up and then change when we had some new intervention that sort of could change the whole picture. But in fact, what do I see? I see the most stable mortality rate in the SEER data. There's no evidence it's changing one way or another. Epidemic of disease? No, no. It looks a lot more like an epidemic of diagnosis. And it matters. We take out the thyroid and thyroid again. The thyroid's an important organ. When we take out the thyroid, we all of a sudden we have to give people thyroid replacement. It's not easy to get the right level of thyroid replacement. If you don't give them enough, they feel terrible. You give them too much, they feel terrible. There are also small glands behind the thyroid that are often affected and they may affect calcium metabolism. There's also a nerve there. We've got to be really careful about this stuff. And by the way, this epidemic is ongoing up to 2009 now, it's about 13. This is the most one of the most concerning uh, things that, that I'm seeing is how much more thyroid cancer we're diagnosing. But it's not just thyroid cancer. This is melanoma, the most feared form of skin cancer. Its mortality rate's very stable over time, but its incidence rate is not. It's up twofold over the period as we're doing more punch biopsies looking and biopsying more and more pigmented lesions. Breast cancer. Breast cancer mortality is flat and now falling. That's a good thing. There's no question that's a good thing that breast cancer mortality is falling. But there's also no question there's been a dramatic increase of incidence as screening mammography took hold in the country. And then the poster child for the problem, prostate cancer. Prostate cancer's mortality went up, down a little bit. But there's nothing subtle about what happened to its incidence rate. I know a lot of you don't look at these kind of curves that often, you know, but for epidemiologists, this is a very unusual curve. I mean, it's not that unusual. It tracks the NASDAQ very carefully <laughs> over that same period, but, <clears throat> but we don't see it in cancer. But, and and I, I don't care how much cancer biology you know, you can't explain that curve unless you know what happened in the healthcare system. And what happened in the healthcare system? A new blood test was introduced, the prostate-specific antigen. And it's led literally a million additional men to be treated for a cancer that was never going to bother them. Now, I've always been clear, screening has both benefits and harms. It has both. They can both happen at the same time. Here is my best estimate of what the true effect of mammography is. About among a thousand women age 50 undergoing annual mammography for 10 years, there are benefits and harms. The benefit is somewhere between zero and two will avoid a breast cancer death. The harms are first, about two to 500 will have at least one false alarm in a 10 year course of screening mammography. 
Some women are terrified by the experience. Others are not, but some are terrified by the experience. Some never get told they're normal. They're told, well, they don't have cancer, but something else, you know, they, they're somewhere in between. They don't have cancer, but they're not normal. And about half of that group um, will undergo a biopsy for something that is a total false alarm. Now, that's outrageous. No European country would tolerate that level of false positives uh, in an organized program of screening. But it's also sort of a known consequence of screening. Most people understand there are false alarms in screening. What's less well known is about 4 to 10 will be overdiagnosed and treated for a, uh, for a cancer that was never going to bother them with surgery, radiation, and or chemotherapy because it now is very clear that there are breast cancers that will regress. There are breast cancers that will not progress. Now, I, I have to say, you know, there's no right answer here. Different people can look at this data and come to different conclusions about whether they want to undergo mammography or not. And all I think is it's important we should share it with women so they know both sides of the story. And the other thing I think is important is we need to ask the question, does it make sense that ensuring that all women do this has become one of the most prominent measures of how well the healthcare system is performing? I think that's ludicrous. If, that's, if this is the most important things doctors do, we probably ought to get a new job. But there are a lot of things more important that doctors do. It's just hard to measure it. And we shouldn't be defaulting to a simple measure of whether we're able to coerce every woman in the country to undergo a mammogram. Now, let me take those false alarms off the table and just sort of look at the trade-off between avoiding a breast cancer death and being overdiagnosed and treated for a cancer that was never going to bother you. The ratio of mortality benefit to overdiagnosis harm is somewhere between 1 to 3 or 1 to 25. And I'm afraid my estimate is it's much closer to 1 to 25. That's for breast cancer screening. As many of you know, the deal is worse for prostate cancer screening. I think there is a mortality benefit, but it's small, and the overdiagnosis harm is relatively larger. It's something like 1 to 30 to 1 to 100. Now, with those numbers in mind and that balance in mind, ask yourself this. What does it mean to be a prostate or breast cancer survivor following screening? The standard interpretation is over on the left his or her life was saved by the screening. And that's where most of the general public is. When they hear that, that's their interpretation. But once you understand the problem of overdiagnosis, you realize the logical interpretation is he or she was actually more likely to be overdiagnosed. And that presents a huge problem. Because, in fact, a large portion of the population and some physicians are interpreting the harm as a benefit. They're interpreting the harm as a benefit, and that means it's very difficult to lower the problem of overdiagnosis. In fact, survivor stories drive screening towards more overdiagnosis. It's a real paradox. The more intensively we screen, the more overdiagnosis there is. And when I say intensively, I mean both increased frequency, I mean with machines that can see more, both of those things is more intense uh, screening. There'll be more overdiagnosis. The more overdiagnosis is, the more survivor stories there are. The more likely our patients have read one in the newspaper or magazine, or even more powerful, they know someone or have a family member. More survivor stories, the more useful screening appears to be, the more enthusiasm there is towards screening because people do fine, and the more intensive screening. And this has been dubbed the popularity paradox of screening. Ironically, the more overdiagnosis a screening test does, the more popular the test becomes. And then we stumble onto things. Now, here we're not trying to do anything. And it, we're, we're, but we're doing all this cross-sectional imaging. We're looking at the human body with a power that we never had before. We're looking for X. We're looking to try to evaluate the stomach, but we stumble onto something in the lung or the kidney or the liver. 
Doctors refer to this as the problem of incidentalomas. And it's become a huge problem for modern medicine. Here's a powerful anecdote you don't often hear, but I was told about it uh, when I was speaking at Tufts uh, about a year ago. And it was from a colleague who was telling me about his father, a 70-year-old man who reported excellent health and goes in for an annual physical. His doctor performs a careful physical exam and thinks he feels an abdominal aortic aneurysm. That's what I was joking about myself having as an infant. It's a, it's a saculation of the aorta that may grow and may, may burst, but, many, but most don't. He orders an ultrasound. The ultrasound shows that the aorta is normal, but suggests that there's a mass in the pancreas. And so the pancreas uh, needs to be evaluated and a CT of the abdomen is uh, recommended. So that's the CAT scan of the abdomen now. So the CAT scan shows a normal pancreas, but now finds a liver nodule. And a needle biopsy is, is recommended. The needle biopsy shows a hemangioma and makes it bleed. Patient requires a week of hospitalization, six to eight units of blood, and develops urinary retention following narcotics for pain. Total cost of the annual physical, $50,000. Yeah. Now, I want to be clear. It's hard to find a medical error here. I don't like the error language. I don't think any doctor here made the wrong decision. It's a, it's a cultural problem. But instead, the cascade of events was all intended, you know, sort of the best of intention, to avoid a future problem, particularly cancer. But simply finding out whether a cancer is present will produce some harm. And even if a cancer is present, it's much more likely to represent overdiagnosis than a deadly cancer. I'll tell you why I say that in a minute. And even if it was a deadly cancer, the chance that we just happened to stumble on it at the right time, remember we're stumbling on this thing now, when we can make a difference is extraordinarily low. And yet this is happening all the time to doctors. We're looking for one thing and we stumble on to something else. And that's why I say this is a huge problem that we're struggling with right now. The reason we know something about the overdiagnosis problem from screening was the enthusiasm for whole body CT screening, where a lot of normal people underwent uh, full body uh, CTs in the early part of the 2000s. This is 1,200 asymptomatic volunteers, mean age 54. They're affluent people. They could pay the $1,000 for the total body CT. 86% of them had at least one abnormality. That's a huge reservoir of abnormalities. The average patient had 2.8 abnormalities. The truth is the human body has a lot of variation. There are a lot of spots and things on the human. Oh, here's one more. This is renal cell carcinoma, cancer of the kidney. It's a very stable mortality rate. But its incidence isn't stable. It's up twofold. We're not screening for kidney cancer. We're stumbling onto it. Ironically, this is one of the places where we are really beginning to learn to watch and not take out kidneys. Moving forward, this has been a big shift in paradigms. The old paradigm, when I went to medical school, is you make diagnoses in patients who are experiencing problems. The new paradigm is to seek diagnoses in patients who are not experiencing problems. That's what early diagnosis is. I want to be clear, just as I said at the outset, the paradigm of early diagnosis isn't always wrong. We would rather repair a deep laceration in the skin soon after it occurs than wait till infection sets in. We would rather see patients early in the course of their pneumonia than wait till they develop dyspnea and sepsis. We would rather see patients early in the course of their heart attack than wait till they de develop arrhythmias and high, uh, hypotension. And we would rather see women with a small breast lump than wait till they develop a large breast mass. The question is, how often should we get ahead of symptoms? That's the fundamental question that I think we're struggling with. In the past, doctors treated a population. We didn't think about it as a population, but we waited for problems to develop, and then we diagnosed and treated those problems in that fraction. The early diagnosis ideal was simple. As we take that same population, we'd advance that group in time, and with the assumption that what we found early, would the natural history, the natural course of which was to be those people destined to develop problems. But the reality is, 
very different. Early diagnosis found a whole bunch more patients. And now the natural course, the natural history is more complex. You hope that you've found those destined to develop problems, although we often do not because the people that develop problems may develop them very quickly. But we have another fraction, those not destined to develop problems. When we, find, when we look hard and find a lot of early disease, there's going to be a bigger and bigger fraction not destined to develop problems. They are the overdiagnosed and needlessly treated. Let me be clear, nothing good can happen to this group. Nothing good can happen to because they're not destined to have a problem. All experience the impact of a diagnosis, the labeling, the sense of vulnerability, and we can't minimize that. You know, a lot of health is about how you feel about yourself and how you feel, whether you feel resilient or not, and, and giving people diagnoses is not in their interest if it's not going to be relevant to them. And in this country, it may affect their insurability their ability to get in health insurance, both in how much it costs or whether they can get it at all. Hopefully that's about to be fixed. Pete, you got that fixed yet? Okay. Most experience the impact of intervention, the hassle factors, subsequent appointments, more testing, surveillance, phone calls, filling scripts, and I don't know why I didn't put it up here, but filling out insurance forms. I mean, it's not easy to consume medical care in this country. Some experience harm from the intervention. Medication side effects, surgical complications, even death. How did we get here? Or in the American culture, the real question is, who is to blame? <laughs> well, if you're of my generation, this guy immediately comes to mind. <laughs> Which, <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> Nixon, sorry, yeah. And, and honestly, it works. You know, Nixon is to blame. It works in this guy. You know, he, 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 this is a quote. You know, we need to work out a system that includes a greater emphasis on preventive care. This was a huge part of both the Health Maintenance uh, Organization Act of 1973. It was a huge part of the war on cancer in 1971. And what I think the problem here is, is a failure to distinguish between two types of prevention. Preventive medicine has two arms, and they're very different. One is health promotion. The other is early diagnosis. And when the preventive model came into medicine, we promptly medicalized it into an early diagnosis model. It's what a test might tell you, and it's easy. We like tests. Now, this is a test in my 1999 Volvo. I don't know, you guys familiar with that light? Now, even, in, even though my car is over a decade old, it is checking about 200 systems uh, to try to see if anything's wrong. Even though the car is driving fine, and so, you know, it's trying to make early diagnoses. Um, and I've come to begun to ignore this after my mechanic has suggested the same. In fact, this is my dashboard right now. I got I got to say, you know. This is my wife's car. It's a little bit newer. It's a 2005 Subaru Outback, and uh, its check engine light came on the other day, and it just shows you how things have advanced. Uh, the Subaru engineers, uh, when, when this uh, check engine light comes on in the Subaru, I don't know if any of you have Subarus, all of a sudden the cruise control light starts flashing. Now this is very interesting because the check engine light is picking up something that has absolutely nothing to do with the cruise control, but once it comes on, the cruise control will not work. Now, why is that done? To, to bring it into the shop, right? You're not, now you're really motivated to bring it in the shop so you can get your cruise control back. And I think we have a lot to learn from uh, Subaru. And, you know, if you don't get a mammogram, I'm going to stop treating your really high blood pressure. And, you know, you laugh, and unfortunately, that's happened to some women, in part because doctors are being measured on things, and they can get very much in a position where they're going to trump patient preferences. Early diagnosis is what a test might tell you. Health promotion is what your grandmother would have told you. Now, when it comes to the automobile, and I think about health promotion, and this is me in my yard, uh, and uh, you, you think of basic things. What, what is good maintenance? Well, good maintenance is changing the oil. It's keeping the tire pressures up. 
It's washing the salt off your car at the end of the winter. What would your grandmother tell you about health? Well, she would have told you, don't smoke, eat your fruits and vegetables, go play outside, but first take a nap. It's all pretty good advice. It's not sexy, it's not high tech, but it's a very important determinant of health. And it's also a positive message. The basic idea is be healthy. There's something very positive. There's no sense of abnormality. There's no sense of something wrong. It's a positive message. The early diagnosis message is different. It's to look hard for things to be wrong. So one of the things I want you to walk away with is ask yourself the question, is looking hard for things to be wrong a good thing for a healthcare system to do? Health is more than a physical state of being. It's also a state of mind, and I think we really need to keep our eye on that. So IBM would like to alert doctors before patients get sick. They say that's smarter health care for a smarter planet. Unfortunately, I worry, is this a recipe for a sicker planet? Thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take some... Um, We have time for a few questions. Please uh, stand, uh, state your name, and your, whether you're a member of the society or not. And if you have two <laughs> microphones. Uh, we'll bring it, the microphone to you, so let's, let's see. Let's start on this side. Okay, Alice, yeah. oh, okay. Uh, Kristen Ferry. I'm fascinated by your talk. I had a comment about just how much brainwashing has been done concerning mammograms, and I have a question. Uh, I'm one of the 30% who got, um, had a negative mammogram and still had uh, advanced stage cancer, and I have a negative mammogram within 10 days of my diagnosis. Oh, God. And all of my girlfriends called me up and said, you should have gotten your mammogram. You must. Yeah. And blame the patient. <laughs> right. Yeah. I even had somebody send me a packet of forget-me-not seeds, I mean, little flower seeds. And on the back of it was, don't forget to have your mammogram. So the assumption of a lot of smart people was automatically that yeah. somehow I had this advanced cancer because I hadn't gotten screened. Uh, but my question is, uh, I've become suspicious of the improvement in uh, survival rates, which are touted as uh, a measure of success for uh, these interventions. And I come to suspect that uh, we're, because we're over-treating, over-diagnosing, or uh, we're claiming credit for survival. And so now I have no faith in those statistics. I'm wondering if you uh, have studied this and can give me some ideas there. Boy, that, uh, thank you so much for the question. It's a great question, and in another lecture I, I, I would spend quite a bit of time on the calculation of survival because it is such a biased measure in the context of early detection. And just so everyone's on the same page, by survival we're talking about the measurement of time between when a patient is diagnosed and when a patient dies. And Longer survival times always, and, and, and even though I'm an epidemiologist and I've written about this, I've done studies about this, when you hear someone's had a longer survival, we always assume, well, that's a prolongation of death. But we don't think about the other possibility, it's just an advancement in the time of diagnosis. And that's the so-called lead time bias. So in the context you know, this thing, you got two points in time, you assume it's always this one, when in fact it might be that one. That's a major uh, bias that is well recognized, although not by the, some people who should recognize it. But it's been well recognized in epidemiology since the uh, 70s. Um, and you're absolutely right. In the context of asking whether early helps, you can't be measuring survival. You've got to be measuring the actual death rate. There's another problem with survival, and that is the overdiagnosis problem. That's a more recent thing we've uh, recognized. But of course, the fastest way to inflate the survival time is to tell everyone they have cancer, right? That will increase survival times. That won't change the mortality rate, it won't change the death rate, but it will increase survival times. So, overdiagnosis is a very powerful influence on five year survival and 10 year survival rates. That's an excellent question, 
and uh, you know, not to pump the book, but there's about 10 pages in the book about that with a couple of drawings, which um, I'm first, I'm happy to even send you a PDF of the chapter if you want, because it is, it's a very important area for everybody to understand that survival, and more and more reporters are on to it now, but survival, the measurement of survival time or five or ten year survival rate in the context of early detection is a fundamentally biased measure. Go ahead. Karen Shainer. Um, I'm a clinical and neuropsychologist. That little baby is in bad shape. <laughs> Uh, it grew up into a monster. <laughs> obviously, in my field, it's the same problem yes, yes. in very tragic ways. Um, is that mic on? The okay. Thank you. So, your book is excellent. Thank your presentation is excellent. And let's hope people get educated. And, educated. and, and I, I, I just want to say first, thank you so much for the comment. Um, and, and I, I do, uh, well, on different days, I feel different ways. Uh, today, I feel like we're turning a corner. <laughs> I mean, after I published the mammography paper in the New England Journal, I felt like, I, oh my God, we were in a bit. But, but, um, so, uh, but, but I, do, I do think more and more people are, are, are listening. And I, I actually want to be very careful to say a couple things um, that, that, that I think are important. First, I'm a conventionally trained uh, physician. I, I'm a believer in medical care for the sick. It's not, I, I hope people don't work, walk away and say, oh gosh, American medicine is all garbage. We've got to stay away. That would be a really unfortunate message for me to leave you with. My, my question is, to what extent should well people uh, be engaged uh, in this process of looking for things to be wrong? The other thing, uh, j just on this same topic while I'm on, is I want to be very clear to distinguish between diagnostic mammography and screening mammography. Screening mammography is when we invite women in who have no knowledge anything's wrong, looking hard for something to be wrong. Diagnostic mammography is when a woman uh, recognizes a new breast lump and we want to do a, a film to figure out what that lump is. That's a great test. None of us argue about that. That's a great test. I do think we're beginning to turn a corner. I, I think I'm very pleased. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I was embarrassed this morning that I didn't know that the uh, diabetes recommendation had back, pulled back. Cervical cancer screening, it's pulled back. Breast cancer screening, people are a little bit more open to it being pulled back. And we're beginning to have a pretty good debate on, on prostate cancer screening. So I think, and I think all that is, is very healthy. So um, I'm optimistic. Hello, William Kaur. I'm not a member currently, but my question is, how would you use electronic databases or medical databases compiled from all those electronic health records to combat overdiagnoses? Oh. Oh. Um, I'd have to think about that one. I mean, um, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I can, can you know, one of the things I learned as a third year medical student is to say, I don't know. I think that's a time I should say, I, I don't know. I have to think, I, I, I mean, the, the one thing about the, the, the availability of electronic data, the one thing I can say, it, it helps us begin to see the view from space. Remember, at, at the individual level, we never know which doctor's doing you, you know, something, you, you know, we don't know who's being overdiagnosed or not. But when we start following large populations, you can see outbreaks, if you will, of illness which we, of course, have done for a while with infectious disease, we need to be looking for outbreaks in the medical care system where there are outbreaks of diagnoses. Um, and, and, and that's why I'm trying to get the, 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 the endocrinology and, and thyroid surgeons to care about this problem with thyroid cancer. Uh, I, so I do think being able to sort of observe what's happening at population level is a very important way to understand how our system is functioning. This is just. This is not on. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. This is just a minor point of clarification. On early on in the talk, you talked about two things. You talked about driving blood pressure down too low, and blood sh sugar. And blood sugar. And in both cases, you said, well, it's not so good to have very low blood pressure or very low, oh, yeah, very low blood sugar. Um, were all those patients treated with the same dose of drugs? 
Uh, well, it depends which one. When we were talking about the, di the study with, uh, uh, it, w which was looking at uh, general practices in Britain, uh, there's a whole bunch of different strategies being followed to intensify uh, blood sugar uh, control. Uh, that included both oral agents, a number of different oral agents, and the addition of insulin. In the randomized trial, it was uh, just the, those two agents, which um, I, I forget was trandolopril and... Um, I can't remember what the second agent was. Well, I was just wondering whether it's clear whether you had a greater death rate at the lower levels for both the blood pressure and blood sugar because they were too low, which is what you kind of said, or because more medication was being given. Yeah, um, uh, uh, you know, that, that, that's a very reasonable question uh, to ask. In the, uh, and, and I think that's a perfectly... Uh, uh, um, you mean, are you saying that there's some side effect to the medication other than lowering yeah, blood sugar. Yeah, either more or different medication. Yeah, um, and I think that's an alternative hypothesis. Although I have to say, um, we have a good causal model for why low blood sugar is bad for people, right? And we have the same thing for blood pressure. And we, and we also, um, the, the reports of syncopal events, that the, the, uh, this is a fainting events and... Uh, is also reported in those trials, and that agrees with the, 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 the lower blood pressure. That's what you'd expect to be a consequence. But the only reason I brought that up was because long ago, maybe 20 years, I saw data showing that people who had been 100 over 60 on their blood pressure all their lives, as children, maintained that, did have less risk of heart disease and strokes than did people with 120 over 80, for example. Yeah, that I can't comment on. I, I don't know about that. Um, yes. Um, I have a question as to whether you think sure. the... Am I ready? All right. That's better. Whether you think the legal profession plays a role in this overdiagnosis oh, in no. the sense... Uh, <laughs> in the sense that... Some of my best friends are lawyers. If you some should... lawyers in the room. <laughs> Lovely people. Love them all. <laughs> the question is whether you think this uh, fear of lawsuits yeah. makes a person proceed down a path right. which he may not agree with. Right? A a absolutely. Uh, the question is, do, do, do lawyers have a role in this? And, and, and um, a again, I sound like I'm hawking a book, but uh, you know, I, I deal with a chapter of, uh, on the forces at, at work here, and I didn't uh, deal with it uh, in this talk because it was already too long. But um, there, 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 there's a complex uh, web of forces at, at play here. Some of it is, is simply about money. I mean, a lot of those threshold uh, changes uh, were uh, uh, inspired by people who have very close relationship with the drug uh, uh, companies. Uh, these were, uh, you know, you know, it's the fastest way to make more money isn't to produce a better drug, it's to span the indications of a drug. So money, money is, is part of the story here. Uh, on the other side, I want to be clear, there's a lot of true belief out there. You know, it's a very appealing concept. It makes uh, sense. It's a lot easier to to suggest that early is the right thing to do. We all want to do things, uh, you know, the earlier we do things, the better. You know, it sounds so, so sensible. So I, I think true belief is part of it. Um, I, I think uh, survival rates, the misleading feedback we're getting, where you get more survivors, you, you, you get higher survival rates, you know, everyone starts thinking, gosh, that's a good thing. We must, let's keep doing what we're doing. The, the feedback that, oh, we got an epidemic. There's more thyroid care. We better do something about it. So we get very misleading uh, feedback. And, um, uh, and the news media has a role. And clearly, uh, 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 the, 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 the lawyers and the legal climate, uh, which where uh, physicians, you know, I think reasonably so, feel that they're only punished in one direction. They're punished for underdiagnosis. They're not punished for overdiagnosis. And I'm not suggesting we punish him for overdiagnosis. We've got to train him better. But, but yes, certainly that's a... But, but, uh, but I want to be clear. I don't think the problem would go away if lawyers went away. It might be mitigated to some extent, but it's a bigger problem than just legal problems. Can you? Yeah. Hello? Yeah. Okay. My name's Rudy Kutar, I'm a member of the society. 30 to 40 years ago, I read a book about an experiment in England in the 1950s, which established a wellness institute in a particular community. The name of the community began with a P, I don't remember the rest of the name. And the question is, is this the source of 
our problems with overdiagnosis? I'm sure, I'm sure they did uh, health advice as well, but... Uh, it, it, it is what the source, the community... Where, where, did, where did our dependence on overdiagnosis come from? Did it just spring up everywhere all, all at the same time, or did it come from... Well, well it, it, as I said, I, I ascribe it to, and by the way, you, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a medical historian. I'm not sure I can make this case any better than I did for you now, but I, I see it as being really a side effect of our involvement in high blood pressure, uh, which, which was a very important step for us to take. I want to be clear. <laughs> I don't want you to go away with this guy thinks everything. Because I'm a great believer in, in, in knowing uh, and, and being aggressive in people who have really high blood pressure, and it's because of that VA cooperative. So that's an important... There are some times we will want to cross that threshold into asymptomatic patients, but we've got to be really careful and we've got to be really sure about the full effects of what we're doing. But, uh, but I, I, I see the genesis as being that, that period when we recognize that we could deal with a major risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Hi, I'm uh, Rick Hauer and I am a member. Just wanted to make a comment on a question that came up earlier. Uh, this gentleman here had a question about um, use of um, large collections of electronic medical record data. And I just wanted to mention that I, I have been working on one such uh, collection in the last four years. And uh, in my, my experience so far is that there's several collections of this kind of data around the country. People are working on this kind of thing, but it's a little early. Um, there's problems with the data, and uh, some folks have very good collections, some don't. And, uh, but it's a good idea, but uh, it's a little early still for it probably, but uh, those kinds of things will happen. Okay, Carl here, you're next. <laughs> Hi, Carl Merrill, a member of the Society. Years ago, um, there was a, a priest in, in Mexico, Ivan Illich, and he argued in a similar manner against the yankification of Mexican medicine and overtreatment. I wondered if you wanted to comment on that. Well, uh, I, I, I think the one thing I, I should be clear of, and I appreciate you mentioned Ivan Illich, and, and, and uh, today actually at Yale, it's always important for me to remember and to tell people, you know, I shouldn't get any credit. I'm not Jay Harlan's threats. You know, th this is not my idea, and I don't have any ownership. By it. I mean, th th these are ideas that people have been worried about since the 70s uh, in screening. Uh, 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 people like uh, Alvin Feinstein at Yale have been worried about it since the 80s. Uh, so I, I should be clear with all of you that, 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 that this, these are not my ideas. A, a lot of uh, people have uh, worried about this. I've, I've, m my role is... Uh, been, been one to sort of follow it down and see where it's leading us right now and, and because these those ideas are very relevant. I think they're more relevant today than they were in 1960. But you're right that even Illich was a great book. Brenda. We've got one right here in the front row. He's ready for a microphone. Jordan Cooper, I'm a member. Um, you advocate for a shift in clinical guidelines that leads me to think of the growing trend of payer policies to reflect clinical guidelines in their reimbursement policies. Now, financial incentives <clears throat> are widely acknowledged to influence provider behavior. With the allusion to conflicts of interest earlier in your presentation, you insinuate that the financial incentive for volume might have led to increases in screenings. If this is the case, then we might have expected a shift downwards in overdiagnoses when the financial incentive for volume was removed. Was there a plateau in the mid-90s with capitated care under HMOs, and can we expect a similar plateau or decrease in overdiagnoses with the shift from volume to value with bundled care in the ACA? Well, there certainly wasn't a shift to uh, uh, volume in health maintenance organizations. Of the, you're talking about the IPA HMOs, you're talking about managed care era. You know, the managed care, remember, part of their, their, their uh, uh, appeal was the, the more preventive care. I mean, th this was not a big uh, lever for volume. The volume was on the hospital side, the referral to specialist side, not in the, the sort of screening test side. That was part of the appeal of the whole idea of them taking the moniker somewhat unfairly of health maintenance organizations. So um, in terms of, 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 of 
efforts to reduce volume, uh, uh, they've been largely divorced from screening tests. Screening tests have been seen as something that, you know, is, is a part of an outreach of, a, of, of, quote, good uh, health care. And, and that's something I think we're uh, uh, looking at uh, more carefully now. Um, I, I don't know that um, whether the next wave is... is I think we're, we're all beginning to ask basic questions about what parts of medical care are, are most important. And um, uh, there's a growing acknowledgement there's uh, too much health care. Um, and uh, we're, we're interested in what areas uh, there, there might be too much, but it's not just about money. Um, you know, this is a, an area where I say, I don't care how much money you have, you still ought to care about it because it's about your life. It's about, you know, to what extent you want to be medicalized. It's about to what extent you're going to be involved in the system. These are real personal decisions that I think we have an obligation to be clear to patients or two sides to. I was, uh, Paul Gaillet, I was confused uh, the, with the point you were trying to make in one of your early charts with the score was 79 to 2 or something like that. Uh, the chart clearly showed that, showed that the medication helped. Yes. Which is kind of contrary to the point you're trying, of your talk. Could no, you no, it, 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 it's to serve as an anchor to, to be clear about the value of treating very high blood pressure. And, and it, it is a very important anchor that we ought to compare other preventive interventions to. As far as I'm concerned, it's kind of the, 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 the gold standard we ought to be uh, thinking about. I start there because it's where the issue of looking at asymptomatic patients and treating them comes up. It, my problem is not with treating people with really high blood pressure. I want to be clear, that's what we want to do. What my problem is when we start going down this slippery slope and all of a sudden everybody has high blood pressure. And we make the assumption what's good for one group and extend it through the entire population and all of a sudden we're treating too many people and we're lowering their blood pressure too much. And, you know, low blood pressures make people fall and falls are a problem, particularly in the elderly. So, so that example was, A, to show you a really good research study. And... B, to, sh to show you what a really large effect about treating high blood pressure is and how small it is when you start getting to very mild elevations in blood pressure. And that can be overwhelmed by the harms of treatment. So I, is this on? Okay, I'm not a member, but I'm a guest. Um, I'm a licensed cosmetologist and a CMT certified massage therapist. And I, uh, this has just been kind of like blowing my mind open listening to this because the path that I've been going down is I met up with a gentleman in uh, Charlottesville, Virginia, and he's been practicing something that's called New German Medicine, which is addressing a lot of this, is just letting your body naturally approach things. And so I guess this is more a comment or an encouragement is that when, we, when we're healing or giving health care to others is that... We want to make sure that we empower yes. people. We empower yeah. them to say, hey, you have everything and everyone around you to support you in good health and, and uh, you know, whatever. With what I do, my, I, I call it my alchemies. So anyways, this was a great lecture. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you very much. One last question here. Mary, get this a better mic. Do you want to comment on it? Uh, whoa. Uh, uh, well, thank you very much. It's a, what was my main comment, uh, but but I I, I I do think that um, you know I, 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 again I'm sort of walking this middle line. I want to make sure we don't discourage people who are having acute problems from seeing their doctor, um, and at the same time, people who feel well, we we shouldn't be discouraging them from feeling well. <laughs> we shouldn't be sending out messages that confidence kills. That's just not the road to a healthy society. I wanted uh, to ask the question. I'm, I'm Marie Burton. I'm a member of this society. Uh, would you explain briefly for some folks in the audience for why why you would have a breast cancer, for example, or a prostate cancer that you wouldn't necessarily want detected? Yeah. Very, and, very good question. And uh, uh, also, if you would comment on, uh, I heard recently that Steve Jobs had a kind of easily curable pancreatic cancer, but he sort of uh, turned aside under the advice from... Uh, whatever, advisors, friends, um, and uh, actually died of a cancer that was 
pretty might have been very easily resected or, or taken care of. So. Um, well, I certainly I don't know if that's true. I certainly can't comment on Steve Jobs's case. This is not a case that I was involved in, so I don't know anything. And if I was involved, then I particularly couldn't comment on it. So I, I really don't. And I know the media gets a lot of stories, and I don't know what the story on Steve Jobs is. Uh, but let me deal with your first question, because I, I probably didn't uh, prepare you all for this as much as I should. And why would I have a thyroid cancer that I wouldn't want treated? Uh, the reality is when we look hard at autopsy specimens, these are people who have died from something else, there's a considerable reservoir of cancer in the human body. The organs that harbor that tend to be glands, tend to be glands that are turning over a lot. And, and the, 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 the big ones are the thyroid, which has been recognized the 70s, that people who've died for some other reason, you look hard, there are a lot of small thyroid cancers that people aren't dying from, they're dying with. The prostate is the same way. It has a whole lot of abnormalities that could be called cancer. And so is the breast, particularly ductal carcinoma in sight too. There's a lot of that in uh, women who have died from some other cause, even when they've died at age 40 from car accidents and stuff, you know, young women will have pathologic evidence of cancers that were never uh, 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 available in life. The issue, we're now beginning to think of cancer in a much more um, sort of complex model. I think we all, like when I went to medical school, we thought, you know, once one cell went through one mutation, boom, there's a very deterministic process and that patient was going to die unless we did something. Uh, we now realize there's a lot more heterogeneity in cancer uh, than that. The cancer growth is not inexorably forward. It can go backwards. It's a much more uh, uh, heterogeneous group of disorders. And the problem is, as we start going lower and lower, looking for earlier and earlier forms, we find a whole new subpopulation of cancers. Uh, and one of my colleagues at the, uh, it was the journal of, uh, who was the editor of the journal of the National Cancer Institute, describes it in terms of, you know, they're, they're different kind of animals of cancer. They're, 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 they're cancers that are like tortoises, and they just don't move very fast, and they don't seem to go anywhere. Uh, uh, th th they're the bears, which are sort of slow and lumbering, but can cause uh, problems, and that's the pl those are the types of cancers that, that screening is most likely to help. And then there are the birds that are sort of out of the cage, and the minute the, the cells happen, you know, it's already distant before there's even a local... Uh, growth. So, so there's a, we're, we're beginning to appreciate that cancer is a lot more um, heterogeneous and, and it's not just one thing. And by the way, the other thing we're beginning to appreciate, it sort of matters what environment the cancer is in. It's not just about the cellular abnormality, it's about the host too and what the host response is. And so unbelievably, the geneticists are talking about the ecology of cancer. I went to a meeting, I mean, never heard of it, they're, they're trying to learn about you know, the, the, this idea of ecology and how, how, how the uh, area, the, what, what the ground is that the cancer is, uh, is set in. So I think we're just appreciating that cancer isn't as simple as we once thought, where, where once a cell was going. And the reality is when we look really hard, we just find a lot more cancers than are ever going to matter to people. Well, th well, thank you very much for a very informative lecture. In appreciation of the lecture, we have the announcement framed and signed by the members of the General Committee for you to keep. Thank Th you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Welch.